Bradley and I go back um, at least almost 20 years. And uh, um, I've learned an insane amount from Kansas. And um, he actually works in real buildings. <laughs> and he works at them. And um, he does not model them. Anyway, please give a warm welcome to Ken Browning. Thank you. So since Joe introduced me that way, and then I have the microphone, I'm going to tell a story on the two of us as well. The first time I met Joe, he came to Austin. We were working on a library, our library and museum facility. Joe was invited to come to dinner with us so he, we could pick his brain, and he did. And we're sitting there talking about any number of things, and at some point, somebody asked Joe why there was condensation in ducks. And Joe gave his answer, and it was a good answer, don't get me wrong, it wasn't ridiculous way out in left field, but I'm such a jerk, I immediately asked him, did you use a calculator with that? <laughs> I think he's holding it against me still. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to give you a little bit of an agenda, background, that sort of thing. Here's the agenda, but because nowadays I'm working with mostly attorneys, doing very little commissioning, and I'll go into that as you'll see later. But they got to review my presentation and they gave me a disclaimer to put on the bottom of the slide. I had to take that and shorten it just a little bit because it took the whole slide and it overflowed onto the next one. So I had to shorten it. Okay. So anyway, a little history and background on me. Commercial examples, that's where I talked to Joe years ago and said, I think I want to present at summer camp because I think I've got something that will be useful to a lot of people, especially engineers, okay? I'll, I'll hit a multifamily example as a transition to the residential, then re a couple of residential, but they're minor, uh, and then touch on something that I actually talked to Lou Harriman about and said, I think this is something that can be useful to a lot of people. And Lou said, well, I know nobody that's published that. Why don't you do it? So this is kind of the getting into the publishing and, and creating the, the, the paper or whatever it turns out to be. So as Joe mentioned, I've been doing building commissioning since the early 1990s. We started off. We didn't know what it was called. We just said, buildings aren't working. Let's fix it. Okay. Coming out of the aerospace industry, you measure everything, and then you measure everything else, okay? So that's what I started doing. Now, I want to point out, unlike Mark, who's working in primarily a heating climate, I'm working almost exclusively in a hot and very humid climate, and that's causing most of the problems. We'll talk more about that. But I want to point out, we have an advantage over a lot of others. We have a naturally occurring tracer gas that allows us to find things that are going on. Some people call it humidity or moisture. <laughs> okay. Through all the commissioning, I learned many, many lessons. But I want to point this out because it seems to be an unknown. We used to do lessons learned after every aerospace program, test, so on. And the point was, if you've done something wrong and you repeat it, that lesson was not learned. Okay? You're going to see that come up a few more times. Okay? Well, doing commissioning, that led to expert witness work. So for years, I avoided doing what I call litigation engineering primarily because I didn't have a very good opinion of, of attorneys. But I've now worked with a few that I really like, and so now almost everything I'm doing is expert witness work, and that has just absolutely exploded. I'm looking at my wife, and she pulls her hair out every time a new attorney calls and says, no, don't take any more cases. <laughs> okay. So just to show you how busy I am, I maintain an engineering license. 
Because we were doing building commissioning, I maintain an air conditioning contractor's license. I actually go do the contracting work for my friends and family because I found that is faster, cheaper, and better for me to go do it for me, my time and money, than it is to try to send it to somebody else. That's, that has just turned into a nightmare. So I just go do it. And then as our retirement plan, we own rent properties. And until the pandemic, all three of those businesses, just me. Okay? I'm a little bit busy. And so I didn't have to do things like sleep at night. I also build and maintain mountain biking trails all over Central Texas. So I kind of got a lot going on. My list of hobbies is ridiculously long. Things I love to do, don't have enough time to do them. But, you know, starting in high school, I was dirt biking. Picture at the bottom left, as you're looking at it, is me in... Geez, that was 1977, judging from the bike, uh, racing motocross. So as I got old and decrepit, I started mountain biking instead. And there's me in a mountain bike race. We like to snow ski. That picture kind of toward the middle, three generations of our, our family about to go ski a double black diamond. Okay. My wife and I love to windsurf. We used to have a place down in Corpus that we went just as often as we could. I'd say about once a month, but you know, over time it got less and less as we got busier and busier. But there's a picture of my lovely wife windsurfing. So the bottom right is a picture that I need to describe a little bit more. And that is when I was an undergrad at UT, we started the Formula Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, Student Design, Build, and Race Competition. There were five universities that came to that first competition. The next year, there were four. We kept it going. In 2019, Society of Automotive Engineers called Dr. Matthews, our advisor from way back then, and said, can you bring that original car to the 40th anniversary event? Of course, that car had been scrapped and scavenged years ago, but we found the 1983 body. And myself, the guy that's driving it, and one other engineer from the 1980s built the formula car, replica car, from that body. And in doing so, I got to be the machinist again. I got to be the electrician again. I got to do all those fun things that I'd love to do forever. So, one of the things I'm starting to do again and have been doing is machining. And I actually bought a, a new little or milling machine. But all of this pales in comparison to the next one. So we are now the temporary, and I put temporary in quotes, foster family for an 11-year-old boy. Let me tell you, that has turned our world upside down in a good way. Okay. Here's, I'm just trying to transition from commissioning to expert witness work. So we had repeated commissioning findings. Starting off, we had buildings that were too humid. We still do. And it's, it's not, you know, this is uncomfortably humid. The first library I worked on hadn't even opened yet. And they're putting books on the shelves and we're throwing them away because of all the mold they're growing. We're not talking about a little mold problem. We're not talking a little humidity problem. We're talking major. And recognize, this is a building that's never been opened to the public. These are brand new books. They have never been checked out. You can't blame that on anything but the building. Okay? So, Typically, most people assume that the air conditioning is the problem. Uh, after all, the air conditioner is supposed to control the temperature and humidity, right? It's a logical conclusion. And the typical assumption is that the air conditioning was installed wrong. Well, as we started testing, what we consistently found was the air conditioning install was really good in most cases. Occasionally you'd find trouble, usually they were easily fixed, but the design was wrong. The design could not 
ever work. And that's what most of this talk is going to be about. Okay? The air conditioning latent capacity mismatch that we kept finding and things I did to try to fix or correct that. The next one we kept finding was buildings were depressurized. And this was an especially big problem on restaurants because the kitchens in restaurants have big fans, move lots of air. Okay? So if your building is depressurized, and we'll talk about it in a lot of other cases, you're almost screwed from the beginning. You can't fix that. Okay? Then the typical assumption is there's an air conditioning problem, there's a humidity problem. That air conditioner is oversized. Yeah, we found some of those, but those, that's not the big problem. Okay? And then these are actually kind of in the order of importance. The last one was infiltration problems due to poor air sealing. Okay? Again, in order of importance, the next was they were operated wrong. And we'll talk about that a lot more. So probably the most common operation problem we find is that aux exhaust fans are used to dehumidify. <laughs> I see we've got some people from human climate, so we're going to talk about that in more detail. But recently, recently being the last five, six years, I keep going into houses that have mold in them, and there's a lawsuit filed over the mold, and every exhaust fan in the house has been on 24-7 since they started seeing a problem. Okay? So, pretty soon you start asking yourself, why are people doing this? And it doesn't take long to Google it, and almost every time, almost every hit you get on a Google search tells you, if you have a humidity problem, turn on your exhaust fans. And that works if it's drier outside than it is inside. That's the wrong direction when it's wetter outside. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this, this whole presentation kind of came about from the conservation of, of mass and other crazy ideas. So here's our first crazy idea that the design must match the conditions, okay? So, I'm gonna to apologize to those people who are very familiar with the psychometric chart. I'm gonna to have to spend a few minutes to kind of go over it and make sure everybody understands the next couple of pieces that we're gonna talk about, okay? The psychometric chart contains all the properties of moist air. That is a combination of air and water vapor. Okay. It is not related to a brand of air conditioning equipment. It is the properties of moist air. I can't help tell you how many times I've been told, we can't use that chart. That's not the brand we installed. <laughs> we laugh, but I truly have been told that so many times. I have to say it, and I'd usually say it up front, okay? So across the bottom of the psychometric chart is the temperature. It's called dry bulb temperature. Most people don't need to know what the difference between temperature and dry bulb temperature is. I'm just gonna gloss over that. That is the temperature most of us are familiar with, okay? The vertical axis is the water content of the air. That is a critically important point. Make sure you understand that, okay? Now, the reason engineers like the psychometric chart so much, and I see Lou has one in front of him for all of summer camp, <laughs> is if you know any two properties, the chart will give you every other property of the moist air. That is extremely useful for being able to solve problems. Now, the next one is the relative humidity. Those are those crazy curved lines that go up and to the right, okay? I almost wish relative humidity was no longer a term. I think Lou has been pushing it for decades, okay? Everybody thinks relative humidity, they're familiar with it, they know it, and it causes more problems than it fixes. I'm trying to be careful what I say, okay? 
So what I've started telling people is relative humidity is kind of like wind chill, okay? So they start to say things like, well, the relative humidity was higher here than it was there. Yeah, that's like saying the wind chill is higher here than it was there. Or you're going to calculate the wind speed by subtracting two wind chills. Does this make any sense at all to anyone? It's almost the same thing. Okay? There, is, there are a couple of magic points I want to point out on the psychometric chart. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm just not even going to try it. There's a red dot kind of in the middle of the chart. That is the 74 degree, 50% design point used by ASHRAE and ACCA and almost everybody. We can argue if it's 74, 75, doesn't matter. It doesn't change much, okay? If you look, that gives me a dew point temperature, which is another term I'm going to use constantly, of 55 degrees. If you follow that horizontal line until you hit the 100% relative humidity curve, and they go straight down, you get a 55 degree dew point. We're going to come back to that repeatedly. It's very important. Okay? I want to point out something else. Above that red dot, there is a horizontal line kind of fared through the center of a bunch of yellow dots. Those yellow dots are data I took in Austin, Texas, probably 20 years ago, to prove to people that the dew point temperature through the course of the day is almost constant. It really doesn't change. I see some people saying, yeah, I knew that. Okay, That seems to be foreign to a lot of people. And let me point out, dew point temperature is a one-to-one -one correspondence to moisture content of the air. Okay? If you know the dew point, you know exactly how much water is in the air. Okay? That 55 degree dew point is critical. We'll talk about that a lot more. Okay, I mentioned the dew point is nearly constant through the day. I need to qualify that by saying if you have a cold front blow through, a warm front blow through, rainstorms, that sort of thing, that changes it. But on a typical day, you can assume it's fairly constant. And the dew point temperature will be just slightly below the low temperature of the day in a humid climate. That's not true for everybody, but in a humid climate, and I'm looking at Claudette, because she's got a humid climate to deal with too, okay? And on a typical summer day, there are approximately twice as many hours at the dehumidification condition as there are at above that 55 degree dew point, okay? That means our air conditioner is having to work to dehumidify at least twice as much, probably a lot more than that, because there's a transition between the high temperature and the low temperature. Okay? I hope that's a good enough explanation that the rest of this will start to make sense. If not, I, I, I get a lot of good points by people asking questions, but I also know we got a lot of material to cover, so just kind of think about your question. Okay? So, in dealing with humid libraries, what we did, measure, 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 and measure some more. Kind of like the issue about the psychometric chart being brand specific, do not accept the always done it this way excuse. I'm such a jerk, I got to where when I'm told we've always done it this way, I start asking a question, has it worked? Has it ever worked? How do you know? Okay. So what I ended up in the early days is I came out of the aerospace industry. People had done this for umpteen years, which they told me constantly. So whatever I saw, measured, knew, didn't count, their experience counted. So we started looking for ways we could prove what we were saying. Okay. One of the ways it happened is over time, after I'd measured a lot of libraries for a lot of engineers, I started saying, here's how your last design worked. Here's how the design before worked. Here's how the design before that worked. I became a pariah real quick. <laughs> okay. But the bottom line was still the same. 
We had a problem. We needed to fix it. And we needed to fix it before construction, not during construction. If we go measure it after the building is up, it's real expensive to fix. If we go identify the problem while it's still on paper, it's so much cheaper to fix. So, some crazy guy decided that engineering principles applied to buildings. Can you believe that? Okay. What kind of principles? Conservation of mass. Basic first principle of science. I think most people got that in high school. Maybe some before high school. Conservation of energy. Same thing. Mathematics. Can you believe that? Okay. And then you have to sprinkle in a little common sense because it's really easy to have this CAN software program, this spreadsheet, this whatever, and it gave you the answer. You stuck it in your design and you're done, right? Yeah, you better be checking those because I think I've got some examples that show, yeah, that doesn't always work. Okay, so dealing with human buildings, early on one of the things that happened is this guy named Hugh Henderson wrote some ASHRAE papers. And I met him here at summer camp, geez, 15, 20 years ago. It's been a while. I thought this paper was the keys to the kingdom. This is how we're going to be able to calculate if we have a good latent design or not. Okay? So what he did, let me back up a step. He came up with a model for how much the latent capacity of an air conditioning system drops off with the runtime of the air conditioner. I think everybody knows that if your air conditioner runs too short a time, you don't get much, if any, dehumidification. Okay? In particular, he had to limit what he was looking at to systems where the blower runs constantly. Okay? That's not many residential systems, but it's almost all small commercial systems. Bigger commercial systems, you've got control of your outside air. The idea is still good. It doesn't apply as directly. Fortunately for me, most of what I was looking at were relatively small commercial systems on libraries, restaurants, that sort of thing. If you've got a chill water system, it's a whole different situation. The concept of conservation of mass still works, but Hugh Henderson's papers did not. Okay? So I presented this to our engineers that were doing our next couple of library designs and said, look, here's how we can prove our design works. I was told, that's too much math. We can't do that. I've got this funny idea. I thought engineers and math were kind of interlocked. Okay. Clearly, I was wrong. So some crazy guy named Browning, oh wait, that's me, said, let's make this simple enough that even a caveman, I mean engineer, could do it. Okay. So I started with this crazy concept of conservation of mass. Mass of water going into the building minus the mass of water removed from the building is the mass of water that's stored in the building. <laughs> Wild, isn't it? That common sense stuff? Yeah. So, if we look at what Hugh Henderson's paper did, and that's the top right graph as you're looking at it, what he noticed or what he published was really good. He said, unless you're air conditioner runs at least 50% of the time, whatever water you think you've removed because the coil is cold enough to condense it on the coil itself, as soon as that cooling shuts off, it re-evaporates right back into the air. So unless you have an air conditioner running at least 50% of the time, your latent removal is virtually zero. Okay? And then once you hit 50%, all the way out to 100% runtime, we have some equation, some function that we should be able to predict. And that's what Hugh Henderson's paper did. He predicted that quite well. So, again, this was too much for a lot of engineers, so this crazy guy named Browning simplified it. We said, let's make it linear. 
we know two points. Zero to 50 percent, there's no latent removal at all. From 50 percent to 100 percent runtime, that's where we start to know what's going on, or we start to remove moisture, right? We know what that 100 percent runtime is. That comes straight from the AHR rating condition that the manufacturers publish. We should be able to calculate this. And just using simple linear algebraic equations, I'm not talking about matrices, I'm talking slope of a line and a y-intercept. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I published this paper, I think it was 2004, 2003, somewhere in that. And what do we get? Oh, let me add. This was still too much math. <laughs> we had these crazy things called spreadsheets. I think Mark knows about them. <laughs> okay. But uh, I actually put together a spreadsheet. And I gave the spreadsheet to our engineers and said, please do this. Please do this. And that was too much math. <laughs> Okay, so down here at the bottom is one of the spreadsheets exactly as I filled it out and used it for a project. Up at the top, I want to use a laser pointer point here, but nobody will see that. Uh, <laughs> up at the top, we know what the design conditions for indoor is, is what we want, okay? And we also have the ASHRAE handbook for what the outdoor conditions would be. You can pick if you want to use the 1%, the 0.4%, I don't care. Pick one and use it. But this was an actual spreadsheet on an actual project, and I want to point out there is a column toward the middle called water stored in the building. What would you, how much water would you want to store in your building? I want it to be negative, but if I'd be happy with zero, okay? In this case, we're storing 1.1 pounds per hour, and this is a little two-ton system. This isn't even a big system. Next, next slide, we'll talk about it some more, but we're getting into some bigger systems. So this is how I go about calculating it. I'm going to encourage everybody, I will give you my spreadsheet. You're welcome to use it. You're welcome to make your own. No, I would encourage you to make your own, okay? So I go to the mechanical equipment schedule. That's the top left. And from that, it shows the CFM through the air conditioning system, the outside air through the air conditioning system, Hopefully it shows the entering conditions, not what's shown here, which are the AHRI -A -H -R -I rating conditions. And from that, you can calculate using the psychometric chart because I'm old school and I did it the old way because it gives me an error check, what the actual inner condition, entering conditions. The air entering the cooling cool determines a large degree how much moisture it's going to remove. If that air is already dry, it doesn't remove any. If that air is extremely wet, it removes a lot more, but it's not going to remove it all. Okay? So, below the psychometric chart, you have to get the manufacturer's, I believe most people call it extended or enhanced performance condition, which, are, which tells you at this temperature, at this dew point, at this outdoor condition, at this fan airflow, how much total cooling are you going to get and how much latent cooling. In some cases, they may give you sensible cooling. You just track the two, get latent. Okay? Once I've got all that information, I put it in my spreadsheet. Oh, wait. I gave everybody the spreadsheet. It's not mine anymore. Okay? And what I keep seeing is, you see that column that says water stored? It's a negative number. That's what I want to see. We're not storing water in our building. Okay? 
I have to add something because almost everybody that's presented has talked about the positive experience. Yeah, when you're doing commissioning, when you're doing expert witness work, you don't learn as much from the positive experience, you learn from the problems, okay? In the aerospace world, when we did an engineering development test, so we're getting data for our own use, we wanted a test failure. You want to get close to the design point, but you want it to fail. Why? Because you learn more from failure than you learn from a pass. If it got to the test point and passed, you don't know if you're close, you don't know if you're way over-designed. Your airplane could be four or five times too heavy. And all you know is, ah, it passed, big deal, okay? So, I mentioned I gave my spreadsheet away. I'm gonna give everybody here a chance to download it as well, okay? I also wanna talk about, this was early on before most manufacturers had a, they tend to call it a dehumidification cycle. It's hot gas reheat. What they're doing is they are doing something so that you keep the air conditioner running, but you don't overcool the space. So they reheat the air after they cooled it to get the moisture out, okay? So the easy way to think about this is all they're really doing is getting to that 100% runtime. If you're reheating the air back to the neutral condition, the 74, 55 degree dew point, you've just kept the air conditioner running. So you get maximum latent capacity out of the unit. Make sense so far? Okay. So there is another set of enhanced performance tables for the dehumidification mode. Okay. I keep seeing designs where the engineer said, I've got the dehumidification mode. Therefore, it doesn't matter what the latent capacity is, it'll take it out. <laughs> no. Okay. So, and I'm, I will tell you, I probably should have said it before this point. When I was doing that paper and publishing it, I made a lot of assumptions. I tried to simplify it so everybody could do it, okay? That paper is also online. I'll give you the link to it. You can look it up. So one of the things that happened is a general contractor that I have a lot of respect for, worked with many times, came to me and said, can you give me a checklist? What is this checklist? Well, I'm spending a ton of time just putting together a bid on a job I may not want to do, okay? He doesn't want to do a load calculation. He doesn't want to do much of any calculations, and I don't blame him. He wants to be able to go someplace, look for certain things, and say, don't even look at this. It's not worth it. I don't want a lawsuit. This one's headed for a lawsuit, okay? So I gave him a checklist. I had to put a couple of minor calculations on there, but you can do them on your four function, add, subtract, multiply, divide calculator. This was not hard, he loved it, okay? So my checklist, and I've got examples on the very next slide. If you see blanks or errors in that mechanical equipment schedule, run. You want no part of this. If you see over 10% outside air on standard production air conditioning systems, you'll never dehumidify. You don't want that job. If you see the AHR rating condition, and that's the entering conditions of 80 degrees and 67 wet bulb, that's a red flag. I won't say get away from it yet, because I actually have a success story coming up, but that's a red flag. Be careful, okay? This next one, no leaving the supply conditions. That tells me the engineer didn't even calculate what he's getting. <laughs> if you have air leaving the cooling cool at greater than 55 degree dew point, you never get down to a 55 degree dew point in your conditioned space because 
the water outside is much, much higher than you're trying to maintain inside. Okay? And then, because he was doing a lot of restaurants, if you see 80% or more makeup air, sorry, yeah, 80% or more makeup air on a restaurant kitchen, they just use the rule of thumb, always 80%. And, and I hesitate to go too deep into this because that's a whole separate presentation. But let's just say 80% is the worst case condition and it starts to cause all kinds of problems if you see that. Okay? So calculated, simple calculations he had to do. Did he have more exhaust on his mechanical equipment schedule than he had ventilation? If he did, you depressurize the building. We'll talk about that more, especially on the residential side. And the other red flag to me was when you see almost the same square feet per ton of cooling. That tells me chances are he didn't do a real load calculation. He didn't look at what he's trying to match. He just said, that worked before, let's do it again. Okay, so here's some examples. These are actual, right off the drawings, put them right in my presentation. Top left one is a hotel. Okay, ballpark kind of numbers. These are 20 ton, all the 210 model numbers, they're 20 ton air conditioners, okay. How much outside air is he putting in his building? You don't know. He doesn't know. Is that a design? I would argue that's not even a design yet. This is a starting point. Okay. What about his entering conditions? If he doesn't know how much outside air he's putting in, how do you calculate what your air conditioning coil inner conditions are? He doesn't know either. And this one kills me. He doesn't even know what his leaving conditions are. Well, you know, if you're trying to match up what you need to what you're going to get, and you don't know what you're going to get, do you even know what you needed? <laughs> this is kind of a circular argument. It just goes nowhere. But the bottom line is, I spent one minute with that plan sheet and said, get rid of this one. You don't want it. Okay. And then it's another one. You see those model numbers? This is train equipment. I'm going to ask Andy. You see anything funny about those model numbers? I can't read them. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's probably other people that can answer it, but Andy's right here, so I picked on him. That's not a model number the train makes. That's a typo. And to make it more fun, I didn't get this in the design stage or the bid stage. I got this in the lawsuit stage. <laughs> and one of the big claims they were making in the lawsuit, our client installed the wrong air conditioners. <laughs> 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 Even though when the submittal went in and got approved, they corrected the typo, but they went back to the original drawings and said, you did it wrong, therefore you're being sued. Okay? So I'm just going to drop down to the next equipment schedule below that. There is the 8067 entering conditions. Okay? That's a red flag. Now I have to say the, the spreadsheet I showed on the other one was for this exact job. And here's the success story. I had worked with this engineer 10 years before. I'd given him my spreadsheet, and I thought, just like most of the other engineers, he had, yeah, we're not doing that. That's too much work. That's too difficult, whatever. Okay? He started using it. So when I ran across one of his designs 10 years later, it worked. He still wanted to put the HRI conditions on his equipment schedule. As long as it works, I don't care. But that was a red flag that I could point out to our general contractors, say, this is an indication you probably don't want this job. Okay. So down the right-hand side 
is another restaurant project for that same general contractor that he called me into after it's built and after he's got all kinds of problems. Down the photo on the bottom left, when he called me in, it is so humid in the building, they're having two major problems that he is complaining about. Number one, the meat display case. They have to have an employee squeegee it by the time she gets to the other side. Go to the beginning and squeegee it again. One employee to do nothing but keep the meat case clear so you can see the meat they're trying to sell. They kind of thought that was a little bit much for a brand new restaurant. The other one is the salt shaker. Okay? The salt shakers that were sitting on the table had metal tops on them. The metal tops were rusting a week after they opened the restaurant. You take the top off, say, ah, I don't want that on my food. You can't get the salt out of the shaker because it's solid. <laughs> okay. So I go back and I look at the design and say, wow, this engineer seems to know what he's doing. He's calculated how much ventilation air he needs. That's that top chart. The bottom chart, he's calculated the building pressurization. This is better than average engineer. But let me point at that middle chart and say, number one, he's calculated a 20 to 25% outside air fraction. You're screwed. You can never get the moisture out of the air. Okay. Number two, he never calculated what his leaving conditions are, or at least he doesn't show it. And when I calculated it, it was in the low 60s. You can't dehumidify. So the bottom left photo is after I'd done everything I could, and now they only have to squeegee the meat case every 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and they got smart. They replaced the salt shaker with salt shakers with a plastic lid. <laughs> I heard something. Huh? And rice. <laughs> they probably did put rice in it too, but you know, even that you'd have to replace constantly. Okay. So I'm going to come back to our, oh, let me tell you, this was the job the general contractor called and said, give me a checklist. Okay. They were running into that much trouble. The previous job and the reason we have ventilation schedule, pressurization schedule, so on, is because in the GC's words, I took his engineer to the woodshed. <laughs> okay? What's your ventilation air? How much do you need? Are you pressurized the building? How do you know? Show me. So this job, he put it on the drawing. Sort of. Okay? So look at that building pressurization schedule. It looks pretty good. We got 7,000 CFM exhaust. We've got 7,600 round numbers of supply. Sorry. Yeah. We got a little bit of positive pressure, we think. You see that red box down there around the bottom? He got there by ignoring some of the exhaust fans. <laughs> Our building is depressurized by design from the beginning. So, in my current role, I would say this one is very likely to have gone to a lawsuit, but the engineer, he got out of this one. He died. <laughs> I, don't, I don't suggest that strategy. It's kind of effective, but you know, it's kind of a one-time use. <laughs> you can only play that card once. That's it. Okay. So, so far I've been talking about conservation of water mass. We can do the same thing with conservation of air mass. And here's how I do the calculation. If you've got a method that works for you, keep doing it. But do it. Okay? So I add up the amount of continuous supply, the amount of continuous exhaust, and then separately in a separate column, I calculate the intermittent. Those are the fans that go on and off depending on what's going on at the time. 
And then I can calculate from that the highest building pressure I expect. Do I have a positive pressure in the building under the best conditions? And then I can calculate the lowest pressure in the building. That would be when all of the exhaust fans are on and the minimum number of supply fans are on. Okay? This is a restaurant. Not, I think this is the one I took the engineer to the woodshed on. Okay? It's depressurized every minute. There is no time it's under positive pressure. Okay? And then throw on top of that, you have a plus or minus 10% tolerance on all of your balancing work. So this may get 20% worse if things stack up in the worst possible situation. Okay? So this building is always depressurized. It's, it's doomed. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Okay. Any questions so far? Mark. I just want to point out the obvious thing that, that everybody in this room knows, but the engineers don't. You can only have pressurization or depressurization. You need two pieces of information. You need how tight the enclosure is, as well as the CFF. So I had the engineers telling me for years that they're pressurizing or depressurizing, and they have no idea what. I say, so what pressure are you going to get? And I get a blank one. So you have to know how good the enclosure is. And if the architect hasn't designed an air barrier, you're never going to know. And I'm not saying that something that's got 3,000 exhaust excess isn't going to be depressurized. You're totally right. But you can't pressurize something without knowing the enclosure techniques. Apparently, the buildings you're working on don't leak air. Apparently not. The enclosures do apparently have no leakage. <laughs> Andy, I think I'm coming to that on the residential side. So recognize that I'm one of those weird people that could probably talk up here for all three days of summer camp and still not cover it all. So I ended up having to take a lot of stuff out. I wanted to add to what Mark was saying, OK? I want to see a show of hands. How many people have seen a building that has no air leaks? <laughs> Are you sure? I think Lou has tried to beat that into the head of most of our engineers and architects. There is no building known to man that doesn't leak. It's a question of how much does it leak and is that tolerable or not because all buildings leak. Going back to my aerospace days, we built welded steel buildings to control electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic pulse. They leaked. <laughs> if we can build submarines that don't leak, why can we not build a welded steel building that doesn't leak? Bottom line is we can, it's just not worth the cost. And trust me, the Department of Defense has a lot more money to throw at things than most of us do. Okay. So, I'm going to transition now. We're headed toward residential, but I'm going to go through a multifamily example. This is a over 300 unit apartment complex in a very humid climate, okay? Roughly three years after the building was completed and occupied, they started finding mold. Roughly five years after occupancy, the lawsuit was filed. Not too long after that, I get called in on this one. Okay, so the claim in the lawsuit is the mold is caused by return plenum leakage. That's reasonable. I mean, if your return plenum is not sealed, you're sucking air from no telling where, and it's bound to some of it be coming from outside. Okay, and because these are what are sometimes referred to or some referred to by some people as pancake units. They're uncased cooling coils with a blower mounted on the back and you're building the return plenum as part of your building structure, okay? The return plenum is jip board, nailed to two by fours and trusses and such. Actually, when I talked last time here at summer camp, that was one of the problems, that was one of the commissioning problems we found is they built the return plenums pretty well. And then the cable guy, the fire sprinkler guy, 
you know, just everybody that came after them poked all the holes they wanted to in the return plenums. I think that was a good example because we're going to see it again. Okay. But here's where I think this design really went bad. Okay. The outside air, the pressurization, the potential pressure, pressurization was only supplied to the common areas, not to any of the 300 plus apartments. And if more than 5% of the exhaust fans were on at any time, the entire building was depressurized. Out of 300 units, what do you think the chances are 5% of the occupants have a clothes dryer, a kitchen vent hood, a restroom exhaust fan on? I'd say it's pretty good chances. And basically our pressure data log says, yeah, it's almost 100% of the time. Okay. So our entire building was depressurized. But here's the kicker. Each apartment had no outside air. It only had exhaust. And each apartment, by code, is a fire zone. So now the contractor, builder, whoever he hires as a sub, has to go air seal all the cracks they can identify. So even if we manage to get a positive pressure in the core of the building, I'll call it, every apartment was depressurized by design. Okay? So we started looking at this apartment complex and here's just a few examples of what we found. So the top left is a supply diffuser. Okay? Let me point out that that supply diffuser is made of metal. It's got paint on it. Most of those materials are not very good nutrients for mold. <laughs> okay? So where's the nutrient for the mold coming from? I'm going to say that filter, that air filter that's right next to it, probably isn't removing a lot of dirt and debris anymore. <laughs> What's worse, it's also slowing the air down so the air that does get to that supply register is now cold, really cold in a depressurized building, in a humid climate. I don't know how this could happen, okay? So they had to start remediating apartments, a lot of them. I don't have exact numbers. They couldn't tell me how many apartments they had remediated. This is the one that really got me. They couldn't tell me how many apartments they had remediated more than once. You would think if you're having to do the same remediation over and over and over, common sense would tell you you're not fixing the problem. <laughs> okay. So we keep looking, and the whole bottom row are things we were finding in these return plenums. Okay. Yeah, there are big holes in them. Look below the big hole on the left. Do you see any debris where the water leak that took the ceiling out is still there? It's not there. Somebody had to replace the ceiling that's below that hole. Somebody took the debris out. Somebody knew there was a big hole in that return plenum. They did nothing about it. Just to prove it, the two pictures, middle and right, on the bottom row were taken almost two years apart in the same apartment. If you're going to file a lawsuit claiming the problem is you got leaks in the return plenum, I've got this funny idea. You ought to make sure you're not leaving leaks in the return plenum. Okay. So, shifting gears again. Going to move into the residential. I would love to tell you that I have a similar way to the commercial side of calculating the latent performance degradation with runtime. I do not. I keep looking for that. I'm hoping somebody in this room can say, oh yeah, I've got that paper. I know how. Yeah, the best I've found is ACA Manual S, but uh, I still would like a better solution than that. A big part of the problem is that 
we really don't know what the conditions are. The homeowner, because this is a residential, or the tenant, has a whole lot of control. They can turn the blower on or off, continuous or intermittent. They can operate exhaust fans. We really don't know what we're going to, what conditions we're looking at, right? Okay. So conservation of mass still works. Crazy idea, mass still works. It's just not as easy to define and to, uh, to calculate or document, if you will. So what are our sources of ventilation? Outside air intake. We need that for pressurization. Typically on a residence, it's about 50 CFM. It goes through the blower. It gets some amount of dehumidification as it goes across the cooling coil because there's a damper that closes if the blower is not operating and opens when the blower is operating, which usually means the cooling coil is cold. Okay. Let me point out some, some of the exhaust. Everybody recognizes the kitchen vent hood. That's an exhaust. That probably takes, care out of, takes air out of your house and throws it outside. Toilet exhaust fans, most people recognize those. I'm seeing an awful lot of houses these days that have a laundry room exhaust fan as well. Talk about those more in a minute. Clothes dryer itself is a big exhaust fan. These typically are in the order of 100, maybe 50 CFM exhaust. That clothes dryer is probably closer to 150 or 200 CFM. I've seen numbers all over the place. That's just kind of in the middles at 150 to 200 CFM. But here's one that really got me. Went to a house, in the middle of a lawsuit, the upstairs air conditioner quit working. What did they do? You don't hire a contractor to make it work again. You go to Home Depot and you buy a couple of portable air conditioners that have one hose that goes out the window. Hmm. I know this is a tough concept, but if there's one and only one hose going out the window, it's an exhaust fan, <laughs> okay? So trying to make at least some parts of my presentation positive, I put a picture of a good portable air conditioner. How do I know it's good? It has both intake and exhaust, <laughs> okay? Let me point out in these humid climates that outdoor air is loaded with water. Round numbers, this environment, there is twice as much water in the outdoor air as what we want inside, okay? That's a lot of water. We still need that 55 degree dew point because we're still aiming for the 74, 75 degree, 50% humidity point, okay? So I had this crazy idea. I hope it doesn't offend too many people. Engineering principles always apply. So here's why I'm saying that. This is my first residential example. This is a doctor and his wife's retirement house. They wanted a show place. They had money to spend to make their house what they wanted it to be. They wanted net zero. They wanted the latest, the greatest, so on. They hired me as the commissioning agent before they hired the MEP engineer. The only person that beat me was the architect, okay? I actually had a hand in saying, we want this MEP engineer. I do not want to do it. I want to do commissioning only. That way there is no conflict. I want us to hire an MEP engineer, and they did, okay? This house is net zero. This house has a problem I heard just a little while ago. They're selling so much electricity back at the lower rate than retail the city still doesn't want to pay them for it, <laughs> okay? They have a very large credit balance. They can't get any of that money back, okay? Let me point out, they wanted the latest, the greatest, the best. They went with ground source VRF heat pumps. I wrote them an email and said, I really don't recommend that. This was early days of ground source VRF. And what I told them was, I think the systems are great. I think they have huge potential, but can you get somebody to service it? Okay. I'm going to skip ahead. No, I'm not. So 
The MEP engineer that I recommended because he was one of the best I knew said he did a manual J, but it didn't apply. Nah. Okay. Afterward, after we're having all kinds of problems, I finally get a copy of his manual J and recognize this is a well built house. This is AAC walls. This is triple glazed windows. There's shading everywhere. This is done right. What was our manual J load? Four tons. I'm holding up my hand so that everybody sees. I'm not talking about a different number. This is the peak load for this entire house is four tons. And that includes the outside air preconditioning. <laughs> okay. What did we install? Seven tons times two. <laughs> so I don't have enough fingers, <laughs> but what had happened is they started trying to match the load with the number of small little VRF units and you end up needing a bigger, <coughs> I'm going to call it condenser, in order to drive that number of units. And then they said, and we want a backup unit. That's a reasonable thing. They're willing to pay for it. What nobody knew at the time was if you have a backup unit, the only way it works is if both compressors are running at the same time. Okay? Why? Because of oil return. If you've got one compressor off, it will pump all the oil out of the active compressor into the dead compressor, and it will die. Nobody knew that at the time. It's on the drawings. The manufacturer says, yeah, we can give you a backup unit. So let me give you some rules of thumb. So a typical VFD, variable frequency drive, can unload a motor to about 30, 33%, right? What's 14 ton times 0.3? The most this system could unload matches really close to the peak heat load it will ever see. Those two condensers that had to run in parallel all the time banged on and off, on and off, on and off until they quit. <laughs> Can you believe that? The original units have now been replaced at a mere cost of about $50,000. So they replaced them for 50 grand. Did they put the same things in? No. <laughs> what, 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 what did they do instead in this situation? This is a really nasty, tricky thing. Not a good idea to have all those, all those little units uh, going to a single outdoor unit, much less two. Bad, bad, bad. But what did they do instead that would be slightly less bad here to, to fix this? Two things. Number one, they went with air-cooled condensers. Number two, they went with one air-cooled condenser, smaller size. Okay. Couldn't talk them into five tons saying, you've already got plenty of backup. We got them down to six, a single six ton as opposed to 14 tons. Okay. Lou, I want to add to that. When they started having trouble, they called me. What's going on? And I said, I told you so. <laughs> And they pulled out the email I'd written them, warning them about every one of the problems they were having. And they said, oh, can you help us fix this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Re well, I, yeah, I'll say it. I still am in contact with these folks. They're great folks. They consider Mickey and I a family. So, yeah, I helped them. And no, I didn't charge them. Okay. Even though... I told them what was happening was exactly what I warned them about. Anyway, residential example number two. This is a nice house in a nice subdivision in a humid climate. House was built in 2012. Energy Star rated, Energy Star 2.0 for anybody that's interested. It had a mold remediation in 2017 and 2018. Many of the subcontractors were sued, not the least of which is the HVAC subcontractor, because you know if there's a humidity and mold problem, it is the air conditioner's problem. 
Okay. So the entire HVAC system, including all the ducting, was ripped out and replaced. Okay. Then they went and added more attic vents because you know if you've got a problem in the attic, it's too little ventilation. What else did they do? Well, since you got virtually all the sheetrock down, you got a chance to go to seal up the place even better. So they did a whole lot of air sealing and they made it even tighter. Notice that roughly a year later, they're in mold remediation again. I had this funny idea. Well, let me back up and go a different way first. One of the things that was blamed on the second remediation is they had used R6 ducts instead of R8 ducts. I said, so? And they said, well, it's less insulation, so the ducts are sweating. Yeah, probably. So I did a calculation. This is undergraduate heat transfer calculation and said, look, the outside temperature of the duct changes by about a degree, maybe less depending on who calculates it, okay? If R6 is the problem, R8 is not the fix, <laughs> okay? So crazy idea number one, if replacing the entire HVAC system and the mold returns, the HVAC system was not the problem. I know, weird idea. And then crazy idea number two, if the mold came back faster, whatever the solution you thought it was, went in the wrong direction. So we ran a little experiment because I'm seeing so many exhaust fans running 24 seven to fix the humidity problem. Our house does not have a laundry room exhaust fan. I think that's a good idea. But I recognize in your market, Mr. Builders, Ms. Builders, you may not be able to sell that. I'm okay with that. But we ran an experiment on our laundry room that does not have an exhaust fan. Now, let me tell you, this is a statistically significant sample of one. <laughs> okay. And what we found is through the entire day of doing laundry, our peak dew point barely went up at all. I'm going to suggest, and you may want to do your own testing to verify this, that that exhaust fan is hurting you more than it's helping you in almost every case. You've already got a big exhaust fan running. We call those clothes dryers. <laughs> okay? So, builders, my first suggestion is don't put an exhaust fan in the laundry room. Again, I recognize in your market that may not be possible. You may have to put an exhaust fan in there because people say they need them. Here's crazy idea number two. For every exhaust fan you put in the house, do not put a switch on it. Put a timer. Okay? I would say two hour timer max, not an eight hour timer. Two hours and probably one hour is plenty. Recognize that as long as it is more humid outside than whatever is you're trying to control the humidity on, your exhaust fan is working against you. Let it run continuously. Okay? I'm going to skip this one because I think I'm running on time. And next comes, yeah. So next comes our fungal growth patterns. So these are just a few examples of mold issues I see. And let me, let me point this out. I'm not a licensed mold assessment consultant. I'm not allowed to talk about mold in Texas. We're not in Texas, so I'm going to talk about mold. <laughs> okay. The photo is something I stole from an EPA document, but it shows exactly what I wanted to see, and I thought I had given credit to the APA document, but I see through all the edits it didn't show up. It's probably underneath the picture, okay? So, if you start to see mold, you have 
a really good opportunity to tell where that mold is coming from, what the source is. Okay? So you have to have three things for mold to occur. You have to have mold spores. They're ubiquitous. They're everywhere all the time. Generally speaking, we do not have air filters that are good enough to stop mold spores. And if we did, they stop airflow too, so we can't use them anyway. Okay? You need a nutrient. Mold doesn't grow on something that can't get food out of, right? We build our houses out of wood and paper. That's mold candy, okay? But also recognize that dust and dirt generally has enough nutrients that you can start to get mold even on that. So our primary means to control mold is to control the water. If you keep the water source under control, you tend to eliminate most mold problems, okay? So there are other parameters, oxygen, temperature, you can go on and on. Those are the big three. If you get those three, you probably have most of your problem resolved, okay? A wise person once said, find the mold, he found the water. This is some guy named Steve Brick. I think everybody's seen his name tag floating around lately. Okay. But let me also add, there's a time component here. If you go looking for mold to try to figure out what's going on too soon, you don't have enough mold. My eyes cannot detect a few little pieces of mold. I'm not using the correct term, I know. Don't worry about it. If you wait too long, there's mold everywhere. I get no feedback, no useful information. If you walk into a room, it's like, yeah, it's everywhere. Start remediation because well, I can't help you until we know more. Okay? And hopefully, by tearing out all the mold, we'll find the cause. So I want to point out in this picture, the entire ceiling is pretty much covered with mold, right? This is a very opportune time. Also notice that coming out of the doorway to the back, you can see the path that the water is taking to get to that ceiling. Our problem is inside that room. It's not out here where all the mold is. Okay? I'm looking at somebody who's probably seen this exact thing. <laughs> Let me point out, this is fiberglass insulation. Yes, it has a jacket on it. That jacket may have paper in it, but according to the submittal sheet, it's there's no nutrient value there, okay? But let me point out something that I found very interesting. That chill water piping on the left photo, yeah, I can see how that could get cold enough and it could be condensing if there's a problem with the insulation. What's happening on the right? Our heating water is growing mold in similar patterns, similar amounts. What happens if our insulation is not good on our heating water piping? It's not getting cold. We don't have an insulation problem. We have a humid air, water in the air problem. Okay, here's a return plenum. Let me point out something that may not be obvious. I hope everybody can see it on the screen. But look at the jip board in the top closest to us. You notice anything about that? It's newer. If you look at the chip board farther away, especially where there's water staining and mold, it's older. Any ideas what's going on here? Here's what I think's going on here. I think they had a water leak because directly above that is a bathtub or a shower. And they replaced what they could get to and they left what they couldn't get to. But if I look along the very bottom and along where the drywall tape should be, it's still wet. They remediated, sort of, yeah. but they didn't address the problem. It's still wet. Okay, I'm almost done. Here's another one that's kind of my favorite lately. <laughs> Seems like every month or so I've got a new favorite mold picture. You see that Morton salt container? Do you see? 
It's growing mold on the top of it. If you look toward the bottom of that container, the cardboard container itself is coming apart. Look at the, I'll call it divider because I'm probably going to use the wrong term, between the two cabinet doors. You see all the mold growing on that? You see the garlic salt? Now that one, if that had been the only thing I saw in there, I said somebody may have had dirty hands and left nutrients on it and, you know. Now, you take all of this in and say, there's a humid air leak right here, okay? And sure enough, when we start doing the infrared scan with the blower door depressurizing, this lit up like a flare. Now here's one that's from several years back, but I'd never seen anything that was so clear as to what's going on. Almost every ceiling under a, a attic space looked like what you see on the left. And I had to use a picture that shows bigger spots because the really small spots just didn't come out at all. But almost everywhere on the ceiling were these little tiny eighth inch diameter brown water spots. Okay. And it got worse if you went into a closet or an area that really didn't have a whole lot of air circulation. So, what's going on in that one? I'll tell you what's going on. The attic is wet enough. We are driving water right through the insulation, right through the chipboard ceiling. Just about every inch of that ceiling is subjected to water diffusion out of the attic. Okay? People tend to say, how can that happen? Well, here's a graph that Lou Harriman let me use, even if I got the location wrong, that uh, shows that even in a vented attic, in the morning time frame, the attic dew point temperature goes way above the outdoor dew point temperature. I've repeated this with my own data in the Houston area, in the Austin area, many places. This is not a, this house was built wrong. This is not a, there's not enough ventilation. This is consistent. And then you start looking back through old information. And I actually found a 1996 National Institute of Standards and Technology paper. It said, and I'm going to read it. The ceiling construction functions as a, quote, pass-through system, unquote, where moisture readily flows through, from, through it from the roof cavity into the indoor environment where the air conditioner has to remove it. I'm going to pick on an MEP engineer, or at least an HVAC engineer, and say, how many times have you included that moisture load in your calculation? I know I haven't, ever. This is real. This is happening, okay? And then that guy, Steve Brick, whoever it is, oh wait, that's Joe, wrote this about a year and a half ago where he said, vented roofs cause moisture problems south of the Mason-Dixon line and east of Interstate 35 in Texas. He's trying to give us hard data on you're in a humid environment don't do dumb things. I don't know who would have said that. Okay, this is a different problem. This is an air conditioner supply plenum. What do we know about air conditioner supply plenums? They're cold. If we're removing the moisture from the air, they're wet. They have to be wet. They're running at close to 100% relative humidity all the time. So we have mold spores, we can't get rid of them. We have water, we can't get rid of that here. Our only way to control mold is to control the nutrients. Yes, there are a few other ways, UV lights, blah, 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 make it an inhospitable environment. But the most common, the least expensive way is you control the nutrients. You remember that air filter I showed? 10 slides ago? I can't say it was this very apartment, but it was probably similar. Okay? So here's another one. 
This is the same house on the same day. And when I started seeing mold growing on the hard surface of the refrigerator and I could find no handprints, jelly covered spots, whatever, huh, this is a clue. What could this be? Oh wait, the refrigerator door is probably the coldest spot in this area, right? Water is condensing out of the air onto the coldest surface it can find. Kind of like that barbecue restaurant where they had the squeegee, the meat case. Yeah, this is the most affected dehumidifier in this house, <laughs> is the outside surface of the refrigerator. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I tend to want my refrigerator exterior to be about room temperature, right? So, and the leather chair just kind of nails it down. This is a problem of too high indoor humidity. The moisture content of the air is just too high. Okay? So, Joe told me that I could not charge a commission. Boy, I wanted to with this big a group. But I'll pay a commission instead. So, Betsy tells me these will be available. I would say if I tried to type all of this gobbledygook in, I'm going to have at least 10 typos in it. So the top one is a Dropbox link that has my spreadsheet. I told you I'd give everybody a copy, even though I encourage you to do your own. It also has a copy of the paper, the conservation mass paper. Okay. Given time, I'll probably add to that and add some instructions for how I do the the, how I use the spreadsheet. I also looked for places where the conservation of mass paper is available, and it is on ResearchGate. Okay? And there's the link to it. Unfortunately, it's also fairly long, but at least that makes sense to me. I can type part of that link. But an interesting thing happened when I was looking for my own paper. It popped up on a UK website. <laughs> I'm going to bet they pulled it off of ResearchGate and just put it on their website. Let me warn everybody, if you get that paper out of the Dropbox link, I've corrected a unit's error that is not corrected on ResearchGate or the UK paper. There is a minutes unit that should be hours unit. Okay? I think anybody that does this regularly will look at it and say, that's wrong. I know that. But... Just a warning. Okay? I think we're done. So. I've got a two-part answer. The first part is, that was exactly the problem I was facing early on. And the solution ended up being, I had to collect enough data on this architect, on this engineer, on this type of building to be able to say, if we do that again, you will have these same problems again. Until I had that, I was relying on Lou and Andy and Mark and a number, and Joe, that were publishing a lot of papers where I could say, this applies to us. We're in the same climate zone. This is what I would expect to happen. Okay? That's the best information I had until I had enough data to prove it. Okay? Uh, hi, Greg, I'm Frank um, I thought I heard you say in the Benthadatic case that the dew point was actually higher than the outside air. 
You mean that chart? That very chart? The one that I have now duplicated in many, many other attics, in many other climates? You know, when this is in Florida, you kind of say, wow, that's a really humid environment. I can see where that might happen there in Austin, Texas. Duplicated that. Maybe the peaks weren't as high, but I guarantee you every morning when the sun comes out and drives the moisture out of the wood and fluffy stuff that's in your attic, it will drive the dew point above the outdoor air. Joe, you want to add anything to that? Wood sucks. <laughs> It is far worse after a clear night. It still happens on a cloudy night. So what happens in a lot of really humid environments is shortly after sundown, it's a relatively clear night. At some point, you have a layer of clouds that builds up, and you're no longer radiating from the roof to essentially 0K in outer space. It's not truly that, but but the, you're now radiating to that cloud deck, but that cloud deck is still much, much cooler than your ground temperature, and I'm talking ground air temperature, not soil temperature. So, uh, Ben Knott from Community Housing Partners. I just wanted to share a, a brief, um, or, or a halfway solution that I have for uh, your going from commercial to residential and trying to evaluate what's the loss in latent capacity of a, a residential system that doesn't run as frequently. So my approach has been um, as the uh, oversizing at peak dew point, right, the capacity above the load at peak dew point, um, as that causes the system to run 15 minutes or less, you have a sensible heat ratio of one. And then I back up from that to determine um, how much moisture removal capacity of that system has. I love it. That's exactly the same thing I've tried to do. If what I'm saying to engineers with umpteen years experience, yeah. I made this up, it works, trust me. Isn't that the same thing they're saying to me and I'm saying, no, I don't trust you? So, still good information. I'm glad the whole group is getting to hear it, but at the same time, I'm looking for something a lot better. So far, the best I've found is ACA Manual S. And, yeah, I do my own a lot. Okay. Hi, well, I have two questions, but I think the first one is a quick is I've been having trouble finding Manual S expanded grading data sometimes for some companies. It's like, I'll ask train for it, and they'll be like, we can't get it to you. Like, why not? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and because I, when I performed the manual um, as acting less, you have to have expanded grading data. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, how do you convince clients slash builders and HVAC contractors to get the manual JS and D done before actually going to the house, installing everything, and then calling me and be like, can you give us the manual JS and D? And then they put two 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 ton of heat pumps and one two ton of mini split and they call me after this and they're like they are like can you do the manual JSD? And I'm just like how would I how would I even start? Because you already done the whole system and they only went up for code compliance in the state of Louisiana. And I'm just like this is a mess. But that's my two questions. So I'll try to give you two good answers. Number one, every manufacturer wants their information in the right hands. They don't want it in the wrong hands. They do not want every homeowner that's ever complained about their air conditioner calling them saying, but I found your data and it said it should work, right? You're going to have to get that through somebody the manufacturers want. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is, if you Google it, I have yet to find a manufacturer. I can't find any performance data, the enhanced performance data, but it's usually not on the first page of Google results. It's on the second or third or fourth page, and it's coming through one of the dealers that has posted that online. 
Okay? If that doesn't work, Call the dealer, you might get somewhere, you may not. Recognize a lot of the dealers are dealing with the problem of they can't get to all of the no cooling calls today or this week, and they're not going to spend time on something they may never get a dollar out of, and I don't blame them. Okay. Uh, I hesitate to say this, but I'll go ahead and say it. There is a website called HVAC Talk. I bet a fair number of people in here know that. And if you get on there and get on the portion that is not public, they show you the links to every one of the manufacturers I've ever looked for. You'll probably have to talk to a local dealer for whatever that brand is and get them to recognize what you're doing is to their benefit not their detriment, and most of the time they've been helpful, but you know, I'm an AC contractor. I can get this information myself, except for those manufacturers that say things like, well, you didn't sell $60,000 worth of equipment this year or last year. You're no longer our dealer. Okay, I can get it other ways. Okay, you had a second question that I haven't touched on yet. Oh. How to get people to do the manual J and D. This is a 2,000 square foot house. We already put six tons in there. Two different deposits. One, two tons in the display. I don't know how many deposits. How many deposits are going to do? We already installed it. And everything's running. They're now just waiting for when the J and D to be completed so that people can move in for code compliance. So I'm like, this is not going to be. Daniel S. is going to show it's not going to be any code compliance. So again, multi-part answer to a multi-part question. Supposedly, in every jurisdiction that issues permits, you have to submit your manual J to get a permit. But, but there, there's one more step. You'd have to get the permit before the installation. Yes. In okay. those cases, what you said worked. <laughs> so, and there are also cases where you do not have authority having jurisdiction. You're not getting a permit at all. And the second part of my answer is, sucks to be you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying that to you. I would tell that to the HVAC contractor that has not, now called you and said, I've got a problem. Can you help it? You know, talk to Obi Joe here about how, the, how many times he's been called in after the fact to fix somebody that's done something stupid. Uh, then, Sarah, that should hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and it should hurt soon. And, and, when you're dead, I don't care. You put your hand on the stove, it goes out. That's important because it happens right away. If you put your hand on the stove, it doesn't hurt for two or three years. That's a problem. So a student should hurt quickly. And, then, and you can help the person who put the hand there and hurt them sooner. <laughs>